Tonight, supreme reform. Extremism is undermining the public confidence in the court's decisions. Term limits, an ethics code that can actually be enforced, an immunity reversal. It's what President Biden wants, but it likely won't happen, at least not now. Still, we're doing a pulse deep dive on this historic move. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christian. Former President Trump telling supporters if they pick him now, they won't have to pick him again. A former campaign staffer on if this is real or just extreme rhetoric designed to get clicks. Plus, we're taking your questions about both Trump and Harris campaigns as we take a look at people, power, and politics. This is The Pulse. And no, the news never stops, and neither do we, as we kick off yet another busy week here on The Pulse. Thanks for staying up late with us, everybody. I'm Root Raj. You know, it's something we told you about a couple of weeks ago, that it could be coming, and now it's here. President Biden wants to make the U.S. Supreme Court go through a makeover. It's an uphill battle. The three things he wants include term limits. We'll dive into that in just a moment. But first, breaking news tonight on The Pulse, Vice President Harris's veep stakes could actually have a Michigan connection. And it's this guy, Michigan Senator Gary Peters. Now, this is according to a report by Axios. We know how big of a battleground state Michigan is, really seen as a must-win for Democrats. And Axios reports strong union support could make him a solid option. A Michigan Democratic Party official telling Axios Peters is interested in the job. And another senior House Democrat from our state says his name is in that mix. Now, while that's true, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro is getting a lot of attention, a lot of face time, and is still considered on top of the list in the veep stakes. Back now to the Supreme Court reforms President Biden mentioned. You know, one of the key parts is term limits. It's a really big one. And we'll get to that in just a second. But right now, we say it every night, people first, pundit second. So here's a pulse check. Do you think lifetime appointments for justices should be a thing of the past? I would be in agreement with uh, this, his particular uh, goals in, in regard to the uh, uh, Supreme Court. They're out of touch with everyday society, mm -hmm. and it seemed like some of them are corrupt. Well, I think uh, age is a factor. Um, I think if um, they lose some of their cognitive ability uh, in their elder years, that uh, there should be uh, a mechanism to uh, remove them. All right, so if you see me walking around with my cell phone and you have a thought about anything you see on this show, just come up to me and tell me. I'd love to get your thoughts. We may put it on the air right here. You know, this proposal would mean sweeping changes, or as I'll call it tonight, supreme reforms to this Supreme Court, unlike anything we've seen in our country's history. So let's do a deep dive into just what the court could look like if the president has its way. The biggie? term limits. We know from our high school government class that justices get lifetime appointments as it stands right now. Under the president's plan, that would go away. In its place, 18-year term limits. So here's how that would work. The president would appoint a justice every two years for one of those terms. President Biden argues that would make sure the court changes with some regularity and makes the nomination process more predictable. You know, something we've also heard a lot of enforceable code of ethics. The president wants Congress to pass a law requiring all these folks to disclose gifts, refrain from political activity, and rest, recuse themselves from conflicts of interest involving them or their spouses. That's something that many of us in corporate America have to abide by. Why shouldn't they? That's the argument. They'll remember, of course, the court adopted its first code of ethics last fall. But here's the catch. Compliance is left up to each justice. Another big controversy, the high court's ruling that former presidents, in this case, former President Trump, are immune from prosecution for acts that fall under their constitutional duties. Well, President Biden wants that to go away as well. You see, he wants Congress to pass a constitutional amendment reversing the Supreme Court's ruling and limiting that immunity. Fun fact, the last time the Constitution was amended, back in 1992, it was the 27th Amendment, which says pay changes for members of Congress take effect after the next election. You know, President Biden gave a speech at the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, where he spoke about those reforms. And he railed on the recent decisions by the court, which he says show the court is simply too politicized. I'm certain we need these reforms. We need these reforms to restore trust in the courts, preserve the system of checks and balances that are vital to our democracy. 
but also common sense reforms that the vast majority of the American people support, as well as leading constitutional law scholars, progressives, and conservatives. I look forward to working with the Congress to implement these necessary reforms. So you may ask, what's next? I'll tell you what's next. A big fight, a big battle right there. Any of these changes would have to go through Congress. And with how close of a divide it is in both chambers, this likely won't happen before the election. But Democrats hope it'll give voters an incentive to choose them come November. It has been one week now since Vice President Kamala Harris stepped up as the likely Democratic nominee, and she's hit the ground running. Tonight, something you'll see often on The Pulse. We're going by the numbers with a closer look at the first week of her campaign. The first number you need to know about, $200 million. That's how much money Harris has raised in just the first week. Now, the Harris campaign says 66% of those donations come from first-time contributors in this year's election cycle. And you know what? They were made after Mr. Biden dropped out. And here's the other one, 170,000 plus. That's how many volunteers have signed up to be a part of the Harris campaign. So think everything from canvassing, phone banks, and other get out the vote efforts. Now for the GOP ticket, an update on the horrifying assassination attempt against former President Trump more than two weeks ago. Trump has agreed now to sit down with the FBI as they investigate the incident. This is, by the way, standard protocol. It's what usually happens. Agents normally want to talk with the victims of any crime under their watch doing their investigation. Agents say the 20-year-old gunman's parents have cooperated with this investigation, telling people that they had no idea their plan, or that their son was planning any of this. Trump, as you may remember, was grazed on the ear, and a man attending that rally was killed before the Secret Service took that gunman down. But something former President Trump said during a campaign this weekend, a stop, he really raised some eyebrows. You see, he was speaking to a group of Christian supporters, urging them to vote for him. And that's when he said this. Take a listen. And again, Christians get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years, you know what? It'll be fixed, it'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good, you're not going to have to vote. You mentioned that fixed part a couple of times, and you don't have to get out there and vote after this. So it's not really clear what Trump meant. But I can tell you, a spokesperson for his campaign, uh, in an attempt to clarify, said that he was talking about the importance of faith uniting the country and making sure every American is prosperous. But the Harris campaign, as you can imagine, they had a different view. They say Trump's statement was, quote, a vow to end democracy. So we're taking that statement as well as your election questions to former President Trump's communications director, Aaron Perini, and a Fems for Dems contributor here in Michigan, both of them with what they're watching with fewer than 100 days before the election. We're staying up with us on The Pulse talking about people, power, and politics in a really wild election year already. Joining us now to unpack all of this and take your questions, some viewer questions, Gina Keller with Fems for Dems and former Trump campaign director of press communications, a familiar face to so many. Aaron Perini, and it's good to see you. Thank you both for joining us here today on The Pulse. Thank you for having Thank you. us. So let's get into this. I want to begin with you, Aaron, and a little bit about what we heard right before the break. Um, you know, you, you've worked one-on-one -on -one with former President Trump. When he says things like you heard him say in front of that group of Christians, saying you won't have to vote again, uh, and then going on to say, just come out and vote for me, and you don't have to worry about this anymore, it'll be fixed. Uh, what do you make of those types of comments? President Trump is best served when he stays on script, and sometimes when he goes off script, the thoughts don't always complete themselves, and I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing here. He was talking about the fact that if he gets another four years, that he's going to be able to solve the problems of our nation, and people won't have to worry about voting because we'll be on the right track. I don't think that's the best message for winning. I think that we need to be getting voters encouraged throughout every process and each election. And yes, we need voters to show up now. But as I learned working for Donald Trump, you never want to have to explain or try to articulate what he says. What he says is what goes. And so that's his message right now. But his larger message is get out and vote. And that should be the headline on it. Gina, when you think about that, um, the fact that he's basically saying, get out there and, and vote, get this done, and he's talking to each individual group saying, this is a really important election. What did you take away from his comments? He's already made it clear that he wants to be a dictator on day one. 
We've read Trump's Project 2025. We know how he wants to dismantle the government, remove checks and balances. It's clear what his plan is. Um, we all vote him in, and then he gets the run of the government to himself. But Gina, I gotta but just push back a little bit on that because mm -hmm. we know that everyone, like Twitter or, or X, will say Trump's Project 2025. Mm -hmm. Project 2025 has been around for a while from the Heritage Foundation. Their mandate has been around since 1981. So many of those things have been kind of implemented, not implemented. Um, do you think it's fair to closely? and explicitly say all of it is Trump's? I do because um, if you look at the authors of the document and you look at his Agenda 47 on his website, there are so many crossovers and I believe about 80% of the people who had a hand in writing this document were um, appointed admin uh, administration officials in Trump's first term. But does being a past administration official make the person who he worked for responsible for all of their actions in the future. Well, these are clearly the people that have Trump's ear and he's following their lead. I mean, we can also look at J.D. Vance, who wrote the foreword for the Heritage Foundation president's new book, uh, talking about how to dismantle Washington, D.C. Um, it's just all tied so closely together. We can't not think that it's all related. I want to get to some viewer questions as well to both uh, Aaron and to Gina. Uh, Ali Khalil uh, is asking the question right now, hey, how do either party plan on addressing a really important issue here, the war in the Middle East? Sounds like both don't want to end it right now. Uh, and Ali, I'll continue his question to ask, uh, you know, Aaron, it seems like both people, both Trump and Kamala Harris, uh, this is such a sensitive one because you're balancing between the Palestinian interests and also the Israeli interests. Uh, but President Trump's made it really clear where he stands on this, hasn't he? He has. He's been abundantly clear, and he was clear during his time in office as well. He is a firm ally of Israel, their right to sovereignty and the right to be able to protect themselves against the war in Hamas. What we saw was an absolute travesty on October 7th, so it's not surprising to see that the president continues to stand firm with them. He was the first president after many, including Democrats, said they wanted to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. But he actually did it when nobody else would. He is a firm supporter of Israel. There is no waffling or wavering. There is never any, quote, minor incursion when Trump was at the helm the way that Biden has said, not only about uh, other wars, but in general when it comes to geopolitical catastrophe under his administration. It's very clear here that the war needs to end. However, President Trump would not let that happen if it meant that Israel had to give up any of their sovereignty in order to do it. Aaron, I want to ask you a question specifically about Michigan, because you know, uh, I know I talked to uh, former President Trump a few months back, and he did an interview with us. Why? Because he knows how important Michigan and Michigan voters are. So many of them, 100,000 of them, uh, voted uncommitted during the primary for the presidency because they were upset at Joe Biden and this president and how he's handled the situation in Israel. Former President Trump realizes that. Doesn't he have to be careful about the votes here in Michigan, specifically those who support and are sympathetic towards the Palestinian cause? Well, let's be clear. There's a difference between the Palestinian cause and the Hamas terrorists here. Sure. And so we cannot really let the two overlap. What Hamas is doing is a terrorist organization that attacked Israel, and they need to be held accountable for those atrocities. And what you saw in the Democrat primary was a true malaise to Joe Biden and his administration. So you saw Democrats saying, no, we are not interested in that. I would not be considering necessarily that huge voting block as a large persuadable swing voter group for President Trump to be able to get. His best message going into mission is going to be one based on the economy and families in Michigan as of this point, talking about what Kamala Harris would do, talking about how the economic policies under President Trump shepherded in sure. a strong economy previously, as opposed to rising inflation under the Biden-Harris administration. Those are the things he needs to talk about to make sure that Michigan voters know when they show up on election day, that when it comes to who do I believe for the next four years is going to be able to put the country in the right direction, they believe it's Donald Trump. But Aaron, and I want to get to the economy here in just a second. We only have a few minutes left, but I did want to ask you, but you have 38,000 plus people who've died uh, in Gaza. When you say it's just about the Hamas terrorists and that small group, it seems as though the people here in Michigan, the Arab Americans we speak with will say, no, that's not true, Aaron. It's about the 39,000 people who've died. What are these leaders in our country doing to stop that kind of carnage? 
Yeah, any any civilian life loss as a casualty of this war or any war is one that is devastating and, and should never be anything other than felt in that manner. But when it comes to this war, they need to be clear that there have been Israeli losses as well as Palestinian losses. We need to look at this in its totality. And it is about rooting out the Hamas terrorists. Benjamin uh, Bibi Netanyahu has been very clear that he wants Hamas gone completely. He does not want this terrorist organization sitting on the sidelines of his country and their sovereignty. And those are the geopolitical questions that are being faced right now. Any civilian casualty, one is one too many. And so this is why this war needs to end, because these civilian casualties have shown that the loss can be so catastrophic when it comes to these geopolitical conflicts. And we need to make sure that we are protecting civilians and sovereignty at the same time. All right, I want to get to, I, I, and I'm going to tell my director right now to, uh, to get to question number three here. It's about Republicans earlier this year uh, and the, the bipartisan border bill. I want to bring Gina into the mix here. Uh, a lot of people are upset, including Michigan book girls, saying, why did the Republicans earlier this year let Trump kill the best bipartisan border bill we've had, like ever? Uh, and I understand this border bill is complicated, but we also know that this president, Biden, has had for in his hands executive power for some time. And just up until the debate decided to unleash some of that executive power, bringing those numbers down. Was it too little too late for Biden to do that? Look, this is a complicated issue, um, and it's something that our nation has been struggling with for years. But I think if you look at the recent polling that came out in the last week, Michiganders do want people to have a pathway to citizenship. We reject the plans for the mass deportations and the other thing we've been hearing from the far right. And we absolutely want to allow folks to come to America to seek a better life, to get asylum, and to help strengthen our economy. Um, so I think any deal, and the deal that we did have was a bipartisan deal, and I, I believe that Trump did tell um, the Congress people to, you know, I need this win on my scorecard, and Joe Biden can't have it, and that's what happened. Aaron there. Perini, when you hear that, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes in the media and and from people, uh, including lawmakers who are Democrats, uh, how do you answer that? Is that a strategy that you think former President Trump would use in order to to get that win on the border? It's clear that President Trump has been talking about immigration since he was a candidate who came down the escalator in New York City in 2015. This has always been a cornerstone of his candidacy and his presidency. The Biden bill for conservatives and for Republicans, even without Trump interfering, still allowed for illegal immigrants to be entering into the United States at very high levels. What we want to see is a secure border where people are not entering illegally, where there are ways for people to be able to legally enter the United States. And so Joe Biden's executive action after he undid 92 of them that the Trump administration had done, and we saw record-breaking numbers of illegal immigrants entering this country, when we saw that, what Seeking we see is it's not is enough. Not it's illegal. a little too little. Too, it's a little too little, too late for Joe Biden to now try and take executive action at this point when actually it's the summer months. So more of what you're seeing in the sure. numbers coming down is not a reflection of a Biden policy as much as it is a seasonal regression in people trying to enter the United States because it is so hot and difficult to make that journey as of this point. Right. Republicans have been trying to fix the immigration system. It is a very difficult task. It has we been difficult for decades. That's not changing anytime soon. But this bipartisan border deal had concerns from Republicans even without Trump. All right, we only have 30 seconds left. Uh, Gina, you, you said uh, seeking asylum is? Seeking asylum is not illegal. By definition, to seek asylum, you have to go to the border of the country that you would like to seek asylum in, and that is where you declare. What these people are doing is not illegal, and it's ridiculous to even have that conversation. To seek asylum, let alone the gotaways. You're being disingenuous when you say that. This is not about asylum seekers. People are using the asylum claim for economic reasons, not for the reasons it was meant to be done with. That is and not there are the more gotaways that we don't even know about of people who are not claiming for asylum. Don't Aaron, be disingenuous. Aaron no, Perini, you're the Aaron one that's Perini, being disingenuous. Gina, listen, this is a passionate topic <laughs> and one that the numbers games will be played on both sides. Yeah. But the bottom line right now is this. Kamala Harris had the responsibility of controlling the border. She's going to get some criticism in this campaign for not being the czar, but for perhaps not handling it the way people wanted it. And yes, 
former President Trump will be answering to a lot of this as well. Aaron Perini and Gina, thank you for joining us both thank here you. on The Pulse tonight. Thanks. So chances are the Harris and Trump campaigns have the far left and far right unlocked, but most of you fall in the middle, and that's a challenge now for both campaigns. So what do Trump and Harris need to do to reach those middle folks? And I back to The Pulse covering all things people, power, and politics from the Motor City to the Beltway. You know, I read recently 10% of users on X contribute to 90% of the content. Makes me wonder how much of the middle majority is left shaking their heads. Tonight I spoke with Donald Blair, an author and commentator on the middle majority about what both candidates need to do. Let's have a little fun here for a moment. Uh, um, Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, uh, the former president, the vice president. Um, there's some people who follow one because of party, other people who follow the other because there's almost a cult following. Uh, and I think that you've written about that. Talk about what you mean by that. Well, it's interesting because when Harris, uh, you know, took over the nomination spot, um, there was and is a lot of excitement and drama around that. But the race is essentially the same fundamental issue, and it's really a referendum on Trump. And as you noted, it's not Republicans versus Democrats. It's really Trump versus Democrats, because the followers of Trump, I don't think, have a long history of party allegiance, and I'm not sure party allegiance is even top on their list. They're responding to the individual almost a cult of personality, it's to some extent. And what you have on the other side with Biden and now with Harris, you have someone representing more an institutional side. They're more spokespeople for the party rather than individuals. So the essential essence of this election remains the same, which is a national referendum on Donald Trump. Let's talk about policy for a moment. Does Vice President Harris um, use the Biden playbook to get elected or does she turn around and lean a little bit more into her more uh, left and left of center viewpoints? Well, that's a great question. And I, from my perspective, uh, she would be um, mistaken to lean more left. And it gets to that argument about the center. So sometimes when you see the battle, you think it's between the left and the right. And that's one way to characterize it. Another way to characterize it is between extremism and centrism. And I think that's what put Biden over the mark in the last election, what him, allowed him to win. He seemed like a return to normalcy. So I think if there is a winning formula for Harris, it's similar in terms of she's got to represent a more, I think, centrist view. And it's more in this, again, Trump, Trump referendum. It's more normalcy versus a little bit of chaos.